for our second half of the hydraulics unit, we're going to talk about uh, pumps and cylinders and some calculations we can do with those. And I know I, last time I said it's just going to be force equals pressure time area. Well, that's out the window and we're back to a bunch of derived formulas. When we use hydraulic pumps, we are considering what they can do for us. So we need them to be able to get up to speeds that can deliver a certain pressure that will be enough for whatever job we, uh, we require. Um, when we rate a hydraulic pump, pump we, uh, we talk about it's a flow, how many gallons it can move per minute, and you'll see that capital GPM everywhere now, and how much pressure it can deliver. That depends on the load you're asking of it. There are lots of different types of hydraulic pumps. Three main ones are the gear pump, where you're gonna take two gears and uh, not fully tightly in mesh, or, uh, and they're going to, actually they will be in mesh, and they'll transfer um, fluid around the out. So when they, um, as they turn, they draw in the fluid, so they create that vacuum and draw in your fluid, and then they move it around the outside of the case and uh, send it out the other end. I have a slide coming up that shows it. We have a vein pump where it creates uh, pressure for the intake, so you always have to have that kind of suction created so you can draw the fluid in, and then it moves it around using veins that kind of come in and out of a central housing. Um, and the one we're going to talk mainly about because we like pistons is the piston pump. So we'll look at a single acting pump and a double acting pump and things that we can do with that. All right, so here are my three pumps I just mentioned. Hopefully they are spinning for you. There we go. All right, <laughs> so our first one up here, we have our gear pump so you can see the fluid is being drawn in like this in either direction and it's just being moved around the outside and then sent on its way okay so varying the speed of those gears will change how fast you're moving that fluid through and you're good to go looking at the second one the uh, vein pump here it's kind of a weird one so you can see these veins in the middle are moving in and out of some housing and when they um, they move out they create that kind of vacuum to draw the fluid in send it around and out the discharge our big one right here that we're going to use this looks really familiar a piston pump so on this extension so getting used to extension meaning like an intake stroke I guess I should put a wiggle, approximately equal to the intake stroke for our thoughts, right? So on extension, you're drawing that fluid in with that suction motion, and then you have your contraction, which is kind of like compression, at least they're both C words. And as you compress, you push that fluid out a discharge or outlet port. So the big question is, where do we use these hydraulic pumps on our vehicles? In a car, you might see them. Um, you can have a hydraulic brake booster, although the vacuum ones are still the most common. But if you have a diesel, it's hard to get those high vacuum levels. So you might use a hydraulic brake booster instead. If you have some modification, your little low rider messing with your suspension, you might be using a hydraulic pump there as well. Primarily where you see these hydraulic pumps are in the truck and coach applications, a heavy duty application. So if you have a tractor and you've got a PTO shaft, the power takeoff shaft running from your transmission, you're going to run a pump. So it's going to have that kind of single action pump. And you could use that for any kind of agricultural application, um, all those dump trucks, anything that lifts or winches or squishes or does anything like that and happens to be a vehicle as well, they're probably running hydraulics off the transmission. Starting to get into the math for this course because we know pistons, we're just gonna look at the piston pumps. Um, the main thing or first thing you wanna think about is displacement. So displacement is the same as it is when you're thinking about an engine, you're gonna find the swept volume of the cylinder and you're going to multiply that by the number of cylinders so it could be one it could be something totally strange like nine or three that's totally fine um, and what that will do will give you the volume of fluid that you can move in one revolution of the pump so each cylinder in that pump will go in and out one time in one revolution so the other thing we're going to mention this right on the next page as well 
for all the formulas coming up, you want your displacement to be in cubic inches, which means your swap volume should be found in cubic inches. So our first formula is to figure out your pump flow rate. So we're going to take the displacement in cubic inches and multiply it by the engine speed, whatever speed I'm asking about the flow rate at, and divide it by 231, which is just a conversion to get from cubic inches to gallons. That flow rate will be in gallons per minute. Okay, so that's all we have to do to figure out a particular flow rate. As always, we'll start with a couple of easy math questions. The first one, they just want a displacement, so we know how to do this. It's four cylinder. This is just like finding an engine displacement. First thing I need to find is the sweat volume, which is going to be pi r squared h, which is going to be 3.14. I take my bore and divide it by 2 in order to find that radius, and then I square it, and then I, oh, bonus multiply it by the height or the stroke, and we're gonna get a sweat volume of about 0 0.478 cubic inches. And that's what I wanna be in. If I want the displacement, I multiply that by the four cylinders in the pump, and I get 1.91 cubic inches. So that's the displacement for that pump. All right, looking at number two, find the flow rate. I know that flow rate is now equal to displacement times the speed divided by 231 for a gallon conversion. And in this one, nothing charm too crazy either. The displacement's already given to me, so I don't have to massage anything. It's even given to me in the right units. So I'll take it. RPM is 2,000. 231 is given, and then we're going to get about 11.1 gallons per minute. And here's one that start to finish with the flow rating question. So what do we need to find? We've got some information, some dimensions. So we know we're starting with sweat volume, going to displacement, then to flow rate. So sweat volume, once again, is pi r squared h, 3.14. The bore is 0.5, I need to find the radius, so I divide that by 2, I square it, and I multiply by the stroke, which is the height of my cylinder, there we go, and that will give me 0 0.157 cubic inches. I'm going to take that and multiply it by the number of cylinders to find the displacement. There's only two, 0 0.3. 1.4 cubic inches. I'm going to take that and head over to the flow rating, which is displacement multiplied by speed, pump speed, divided by 231. And that's going to give you 2.99, so approximately 3 gallons per minute. So the hydraulic cylinders I was visualizing before, I would, would have thought of as single acting. You'll notice that original GIF we had going uh, had a little crankshaft and that was spinning it. So the um, contraction was powered by the crank and the extension was powered by something else or vice versa, right? So only one direction are you having the fluid work. Otherwise you have to kind of force it back the other way. So when you have a double acting hydraulic cylinder, both the extension and the contraction are caused by the fluid. So in this case, you don't need a crankshaft and all that, but you need to have a pretty fancy switch and some crazy stuff happening in the pump. We'll get into the pump in a second, but I want to look at this picture for the setup it has right now. So there is a selector valve or some kind of switch that's going to change things. So the pump we'll get into but right now, if you look at it, you pump and you have some pressure in the system and you go into your cylinder and that pressure extends the cylinder. As you're doing that, there is also fluid on the other side of the piston, which is being forced back along the blue path 
in to the reservoir. Once that cylinder bottoms out right here, we're going to switch everything. So bear with me while some art happens. So I'm going to kind of change the selector valve and erase the path that was had before. And I'm going to add a really beautiful new path like this and like this. So this is what we switched up. So what is the difference in this kind of situation? Well, from the pump, we're now going to the blue side of the cylinder. So the motion, the fluid is pushing the cylinder, the piston, sorry, this way. And all the red fluid is being forced out <laughs> into a whirly gig back to the reservoir. So in both circumstances, both during extension and contraction, you have that pressure pushing the piston back and forth and you're creating forces either way. Here's another GIF for us and hopefully I get this guy going right now. Okay, there we go. All right, I kept saying we're going to get into the pump, but I meant we're going to look more closely at the cylinder. Sorry, my bad, I was lying. All right, here we go. So a lot of motion going on, <laughs> but I want to look as this comes in. So when the fluid comes from the pump to this side, to the left side, you're getting that push this way, okay? And then it means that the blue side is going back to the reservoir. When the fluid is coming in the other direction from the blue side over to the gold side, let's call it, the push is the other way during the contraction. You'll see I've changed the name. They had retraction. I prefer contraction. Now, look closely at the red arrows that are flipping back and forth. When you have that extension push, there's more arrows. How come? Well, there's a rod in play on the contraction. It's taking up some of the area that you can push on. So what do I expect to see? The pressure would be the same either side, but the area when I'm contracting is smaller by subtracting the area of the rod. So that means I would expect that on contraction, I don't get as much force as I get on extension. If we want to do math, for this kind of situation where we have this dual acting or double action uh, cylinder, we're going to have to consider math for extension separately than math for, for contraction. And that's because they're going to have different areas exposed to the system pressure. So the easy one is extending. So a little bit of remembering here. Um, our pressure is the system pressure and the area that it's going to act on is the whole piston area. So pretty straightforward area equals pi r squared. This is the bore. You're going to do everything you've always done to find the area of that piston face for an extending force. And our force will be in pounds just like it was on the last hydraulic slideshow. When we are contracting, our pressure is forcing the piston this way. And the problem is we have this ram area or where the rod, the piston rod is attached to the backside, what we would consider normally to be the underside backside of the piston. So because of that, when I look face on, so if I take this thing here and look face on, my area is a shaded area. Like I'm not acting, I'm not applying pressure, effective pressure to this part. So I need to kind of cut it out. I've done some beautiful illustrations for you here on the side. I pre-drew them because they're so good. So here's extending, right? You get that entire area. And here's contracting, where you have to cut out a little circle for the piston rod, the ram face. And they call that the annulus. Um, it's that washer shape. So when you see the word annulus, they're talking about the shaded area in this picture. And if you see ram, they're talking about this diameter here or area from that diameter. Okay. We're just going to break down those extra steps you need to find the contracting force or really the area when you are in a contraction stroke. Okay, so first we're going to find the extended area, which you know is the total area. So this whole circle, um, if we didn't have that ram in the way that we need to kind of chop out. So here we go, area 
is going to be pi r squared, so 3.14 diameter divided by 2 is the radius, and good to go. So 3.14 times 2.5 squared should give you 19.625 cubic inches. Second, we're going to find the area of the ram. So we're going to use this information, the part we're going to cut out. Say math. And that will give me 1.766 inches cubed. Now I want to take a break and talk about what always happens with these problems. People are like, I'm just going to take five right away and I'm going to subtract 1.5 and I'm going to find the area with this. And that would be 3.5 divided by 2 squared. So I'm just going to write this down. And if I did that, I would get 9.616 inches cubed. And I'm just going to put a big not equal to and a no. So we know that if we look at that later. And I'm going to continue on my merry way with the right way to do it. So the right way to do it is not to subtract the diameters and use that but to find two areas and subtract those. And why? Because once you bring in a square, you change everything. Okay, it messes stuff up. So the area of the annulus, or that washer shape, the shaded area, 19.625, subtract the part we got to cut out, and it will give us a shaded area of 17.859 cubic inches, which is certainly not the same as what we did up here. Once we have that, we're golden. We've got an area. I didn't give you a pressure, but say I told you that the pressure was 1,000 PSI. What would the force be, the contracting force? You're just going to take that force is equal to 1,000 times the 17.859 equals 17,859 pounds, which is a lot of force. Do a little more practice before we do the last topic here. We've got a backhoe with a hydraulic cylinder and it's got this kind of situation going where the cylinder has a 12 inch diameter and it has a ram or a rod with a six inch diameter. So we're gonna find the area of the face of the piston when the cylinder is extending. Remember that when you were extending, you were acting on this side so you get that full area. So it's very straightforward, area equals pi r squared h, no pi r squared, sorry, I'm doing volume apparently. Uh, so we're going to take the pi, multiply it by the bore, the cylinder bore, divided by 2 to get a radius, and we're going to get 113.04 cubic inches. Now, the area of the annulus used when the cylinder is contracting, so we're in this situation. Oh, oops, we don't want to color that in because we're not going to use that we're going to be pushing on this side. Okay, so we got to subtract that ram area. We've already got the full area, so I just need to find the area of the ram by using 3.14, the ram diameter divided by 2 squared, and I get 28.26 cubic inches. So the annulus, that washer shape, the shaded area, it's going to be 113.04 subtract the ram area and it's going to give us 84.78 cubic inches. Okay, so if the system pressure is given to us at 1500 psi, what are the forces during extension and contraction? Well, let's start with extension. The force during extension is the pressure times the area during extension which is at 113. So we have 1500 PSI times 113.04. It's going to give us a massive 169,560 pounds of force. That's impressive. <laughs> All right. How about our force when we're contracting? It's going to be the pressure, same pressure, but we're going to have the area when we're contracting, which is the same as the annulus area. And we're going to have that 1500 
and multiply it by 84.78 to get a little bit smaller force because we didn't get to put that pressure on the entire area because of the ram and there's our answer so be very careful when you read these questions what they're asking for and make sure you're answering the right thing the last thing we're going to figure out how to calculate is the ram speed so that's the actuating speed so what they mean by that it's just a general term it doesn't mean just a contracting speed they use it for both the speed of extension and the speed of contraction for your uh, dual action cylinder um, you're going to report this in inches per second so just remember that that's what you're getting so you might have to do two calculations depending on whether I'm asking you for both extension and contraction or just one just once again be very careful what you what you see so look at down at the formula so we see that correction because we had a flow rate in gallons we got to flip it back <laughs> to inches cubed and we have an area and then we had a time from the uh, flow rate that was gallons per minute so the 60 is going to switch us back to seconds that was where those two numbers come from and they're just part of the formula just bear with it so when we look at this what do we see the flow rate is going to be the flow rate no matter what what could change the area could change so on contraction when we have a smaller area the bottom of the fraction will be smaller so I would expect that we're gonna have a faster speed on contraction likewise if you were doing extension and you had that bigger piston area you're going to move a little slower because you have a bigger denominator when you do your division so interesting so here's a question we want to know about the speed we want to know watch out which speed it changes your area right it changes that uh, that face area so we want to know extending speed so we know we're using the whole thing so we're going to have to for that formula use an area so we might as well find the area use the whole area so we're going to take 4 divided by 2 and square it which is still just 4 and we get 12.56 cubic inches okay our speed our ram speed formula was the <laughs> I gotta remember it the flow rate which is 4 GPM multiplied by 231 divided by the area we just found 12.56 times 60. All right, if you're gonna do this, make sure you do it right. Don't do four times two to 31 divided by 12.56 and then hit times 60, order of operations. Do everything on top first if you need to, if you're not gonna catch it, and then do everything on the bottom. And then our last action would be to do the division, 1.23 inches per second looking at the second one what's a contracting speed well we know that we are dealing with a piston face that looks like a washer now so we have the whole area up here switch to a slightly different color so we're going to work to find the area of the ram they give us the ram diameter is 1.5 so 3.14 times 1.5 divided by 2 squared and that gives me 1.77 ish inches cubed so my area of this is going to be the whole area subtract the 1.77 we just found for the ram area and give you an annulus area of 10.79 inches cubed so here we go again nothing changes except for that area so we still have four gallons per minute we still have just a random number 231 this changes to 10.79 and 60 stays the same 1.43 inches per second so there you can see it larger area slower speed smaller area faster speed Let's finish it up with this slide. All right, we've got a cylinder with a bore of three inches. The ram is two inches in diameter. We've got a flow rate of five GPM and the pump is rated at 800 PSI. Let's start with the force. 
we'll need the pressure and we'll need an area. Extending force uses the entire system. So we're going to take area is pi times 3 divided by 2 squared. And that's going to give me 7.065 cubic inches. Now, they wanted a force. Force is pressure times area. So I just take the area I just found and multiply it by a pressure of 800. And that should give me a force of 5,652 pounds. Next, we're going to go over to the contracting force. What do I expect? I expect it to be smaller. There's less of an area applied. So the area of the ram comes into play because I need to find the area that is not of the ram. Okay, so 3.14 over times 1 squared, that's nice, equals 3.14 cubic inches. The area of the annulus, which is what I need, the washer, it's going to be 7.065 minus 3.14 and that will give me 3.925 cubic inches. That goes into my force calculation. Pressure is the same, 800 multiplied by 3.925, and that will give me significantly less force, 3,000 and change. Extension speed. Do we have everything we need? Yeah, because we found the areas already. That's nice, so let's go to purple. Extension speed, I'm also going to have to bring into play the 5. Okay, so speed is equal to, remember this is all in your formula sheet, please don't memorize these. <laughs> and please don't search around for them, just use your formula sheet. Okay, speed is equal to the flow rate multiplied by 231 divided by the area. So if we're talking extension, we're using, make sure everything matches up, the 7.065 is the extending area, and times 60. When you do all that math, 2.72 inches per second. What do I expect for D? I expect it to be faster, smaller area. So the speed for D, still 5 times 231. I should put a dividing sign like that because I've run out of room. <laughs> 3.925. Is the area I want to use there and the 60 and when I do that math 4.90 inches per second ta-da all done so a lot of confusing formulas a lot of confusing words just make sure you have good references and you uh, like have a good solved example with you and you should be fine